Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Alan Amrakanian with the College of Science and Engineering. I'm the lead organizer of the event, so anything that goes wrong is my fault only, but anything that goes well is uh, uh, contributable to the great AUA team that uh, made this event possible. Uh, so let me cover some technical points, though. I see there is no magic marker here, and I forgot to bring it. It's one of the failures. Um, there is a tweet hashtag, so if you want to tweet, it's um, pound uh, mining AUA. And the email address, if you have questions you want to address to us, it's uh, mining at AUA.am. I'll later on, I'll write this on the board so you can have it. Uh, worldwide, mining has been a contentious and has had a contentious and checkered past. From countries as advanced as the US to the poorest ones in Africa and Latin America, mining has been a source of deep social inequities as well as environmental destruction and at times calamities. Despite these, many governments consider mining a necessary evil. They understand that the mineral resources extracted are the building blocks of industries such as electronics, computers, automotive, aerospace, construction, and so on. In the past two decades, however, there have been some constructive developments. Some mining companies in some countries have improved the process, employing less obtrusive technologies and instituting restorative closure of mines. Uh, importantly, some countries have been able to successfully use their extractive industries and make them the foundation of long-term sustainable growth for their economies and an improved standard of living for the vast majority of their citizens. Such constructive developments almost always spurred by good public policy and grassroots pressure, um, demonstrating the critical importance of, of these factors. On mining, there are many perspect uh, uh, perspectives among environmentalists, activists, and thinkers. Uh, some argue that mining has no role in Armenia, uh, that Armenia is too small a country and its biodiversity and natural resources too pre precious uh, a resource to destroy for short-term gain. On the other hand, there are people who are not against mining per se, but against the way mining is being carried out. When companies are exporting metals $20 billion in their market value and they leave behind $300 million in taxes and salaries, uh, it raises questions and legitimate questions. Uh, the questions uh, of financing the future of this country. When mining uh, companies pollute uh, uh, the waters and lands with toxins and heavy metals affecting public health and future livelihood of communities, some people start asking more questions. Why privatize profits and socialize costs? Uh, good public policy uses business to improve standard of living and wealth for the greatest number of people, not the few. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Salim Ali, uh, will be sharing with us some of the success stories on good policy from around the world. He will also tell us about some of the pitfalls to avoid. Dr. Ali has a very impressive body of work on mining and environmental sustainability. He is currently serving as the Director of Center for Social Responsibility in Mining at the University of Queensland, Australia. He is doing this on a leave from University of Vermont, where uh, he's a professor of environmental studies. Um, his most recent book is Treasures of the Earth, Need, Greed, and a Sustainable Future. <clears throat> the World Economic Forum chose him as the young global leader in 2011. He has been selected by the National Geographic Society as an emerging scholar, uh, explorer and was profiled by Forbes magazine in September 2009 as the alchemist. Dr. Ali comes to us with his wide and diverse background. He's born in Pakistan and now is a US citizen. He has training both in the natural sciences as well as social sciences. He's a graduate of MIT's Department of Urban Studies uh, where he worked on um, uh, uh, environmental conflict resolution. Uh, something that might interest uh, the audience here, he moderates a Yahoo group called Echo Minerals, which has about 1,000 members. Uh, and Echo Minerals shares variable, valuable work and research being done in the field of mining uh, and environmental sustainability. You can search that, Google that, Echo, uh, Echo Minerals, and you can join that group if you so wish. So it is with great, great pleasure that I invite Dr. Salim Ali to the podium for what will no doubt be an enlightening talk. Thank you very much um, 
to the American University of Armenia, especially uh, Alan Amerkhanian uh, and uh, President uh, Bruce uh, Mughazian uh, for his kind invitation. Uh, special thanks to UNDP as well. I'm delighted to be in Armenia. It's my first visit here, and uh, I'm looking forward to being in the field as well tomorrow to learn more about uh, mining in your country. I must start with uh, a certain degree of humility that uh, I am by no means an expert on Armenian mining. Uh, I do know something about mining more broadly, and uh, I'm going to provide a more uh, sort of panoramic view of mining and development. I did try to do some homework to find out more about mining in Armenia, but uh, feel free to interject and correct me if I'm um, perhaps interpreting too much about uh, activities here. Uh, I've got my email there for you, as well as the website for the center I'm directing, uh, and two Twitter handles if you'd like to follow uh, our center on Twitter is Resource Rules, uh, and uh, my own personal Twitter account is there as well, though I must warn you that for my personal account, most of the tweets are about South Asia and uh, Pakistan and uh, issues around that. Uh, so um, it's, it's certainly, you're welcome to uh, follow either one, though resource rules would probably be the more appropriate one for uh, this conference. I've uh, modified the title from the way in which it was advertised in the conference in terms of how I'll be presenting. Uh, and I've, I'm calling it mining and sustainable development in Armenia. And I'm using the term sustainable with a realization that it is a cliche that is often reviled by many. People often say that sustainability uh, is too loaded a term, but I'm really using it in, in the spirit of um, the way in which it has been used within the United Nations system. <laughs> and since the United Nations is in a, a co-sponsor of this event, I think it's very appropriate to use sustainability without having that baggage attached to it. Uh, and indeed, as you know, there is a, a UN uh, Commission on Sustainable Development, uh, and it's still very much a term that has relevance in the international arena. Uh, it also has relevance in the biophysical domain in terms of how we think about uh, resources, and especially extractive resources. So um, I think it's important for us to keep going back to that notion of sustainability as you explore these dimensions for Armenia itself. Now, I'll also betray my uh, pedigree academically. My, uh, my first degree was in chemistry, and so I always like to start off presentations around mining by hearkening back to the elements in some form or another. And uh, in this case, it's especially relevant. I did my chemistry uh, degree at Tufts University where your president used to be uh, a professor before moving here. And uh, I, I remember uh, re remarkably how the periodic table uh, in the Tufts campus all over the buildings, the major lecture halls, you would always have a periodic table in uh, the lecture halls and the chemists were quite uh, ubiquitous in the larger lecture halls. Um, and there's a reason why the elements are so important for us to consider today. Because ultimately, minerals are the elements. And we, we tend to think about the elements um, in, a, in a way that is often uh, deceptive, I would say. Because we, we look at a cereal box in the United States, and you see all these minerals which are listed there. And people think of them as vitamins, and you know it's something good to have, perhaps an extra bit here and there. But the reality is that everything is dependent ultimately on the elements. The plants need minerals. Food itself cannot exist without minerals. Um, and our modern lifestyles, our technological development would be impossible without minerals. Now, how we utilize those minerals, how we harness them, that is the question we have to ask. But we cannot forget that very fundamental, primal dependence which we have on the elements. The elements and the other aspect of this is, of course, energy. And much of the discourse around sustainability in the extractive industries is around that relationship between uh, the elements and energy. How much energy is going to be required to harness those elements from the earth to make them more meaningful and useful for us, right? So those two dimensions really are going to be 
essential if we want to have a meaningful discussion around sustainability of mineral development. Okay, now starting off with that sort of big picture um, biophysical background, now let's go into some of the specifics. I'm going to go to the questions that were posed to me by the organizers of this event. So I've tried to prepare this presentation as specifically tailored to your needs as possible. Uh, occasionally I might use slides which I have used elsewhere, but uh, in general this presentation was very much prepared for this event. So this uh, slide um, reflects um, some of the work recently done by the World Economic Forum. Um, uh, as was mentioned uh, uh, recently, I have had an affiliation with the forum and uh, at the uh, Davos summit in 2012 uh, in January, there was this report that was uh, launched around minerals uh, and uh, development by the World Economic Forum. And the, the full report is available online for you to view. Uh, I was also one of the reviewers for this report. Now this diagram is somewhat similar to what the president presented as well in terms of providing countries within um, a Cartesian plane and considering you know, what is going on with them, though there's a third dimension here, which is the color coding that I'll get to. Now, the, 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 the goal of putting these country maps up there and country graphs and charts, so on, uh, is also again deceptive in some ways. So I'm going to first begin with the caveats. We, we are confined by countries as a unit of analysis because of politics and decision making. The, the decision making is what leads us to this. Ecology certainly does not lead us to that. I mean, especially if you are working in Africa, uh, which has the largest number of countries of any continent, uh, it becomes particularly um, challenging to consider uh, countries as a unit of analysis. However, for political factors and decision making, that's how we have to go about it, all right? So with that caveat, uh, if you would look at the color shading on this, there, there are three tiers, tier one, two, three. Uh, tier one is providing us with the highest potential that minerals can contribute to development. Mining, especially mining, okay? Um, so, what it's trying to suggest there is that tier one countries are those for which if you were to invest in responsible mining development, according to the analysis done by the World Economic Forum, you would have the highest potential for a positive impact. And clearly you've got countries like Botswana, which, are, which have been mentioned already uh, and have an important uh, role to play there. Um, South Africa is kind of on the borderline there, but there's no doubt that without mining development, South Africa would not have the same degree of um, aggregate affluence. I keep in mind my, the choice of words, aggregate affluence, but not necessarily the range of affluence which you would want in a country. Uh, tier two countries are those which have a, a high potential, but um, not, not in the same um, dimension as uh, tier one. And tier three countries are those where um, minerals are likely to have a relatively minimal uh, impact, mining especially, is likely to have a minimal impact on uh, development. Now, Azerbaijan, your friendly neighbor, I should mention, is in there. And uh, the, 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 the situation there with Azerbaijan is different here, I should note, than the graph that was shown by the president because this is again focusing on mining and Azerbaijan, even though it has a, a mining sector, which is considerable, most of their revenues come from oil and oil is not um, included in this uh, diagram. This is focusing on solid minerals, but that is what is of relevance to Armenia, right? Because you also are most concerned with solid, solid minerals rather than uh, with the oil and gas development right now. Um, the size of the, the circles, it shows basically the mineral resource value. So uh, countries like Australia, um, uh, my current home, I clearly have huge re uh, reserves, but they have already reached a certain degree of development um, in many cases, like the United States and Australia both. And so the potential for further growth is not much there in terms of mining contributing to development. So that's why they are tier one countries. 
Now, the y-axis is presenting the Human Development Index, which is, a, of course, a UNDP index, which we all uh, happily use uh, very frequently and uh, was devised by um, uh, an economist who comes from Pakistan, like myself, who passed away a few uh, years ago, Mahbub al uh, And then um, on the x-axis, you have countries' resource value divided by their annual GDP contribution of mining. So um, it's basically... This, this part of the graph is similar to uh, one of the axes which the president presented. Um, so what this is really showing us, this analysis, is that these countries, the tier three countries, are where you have the greatest potential for positive impact of mining. And this was developed, the, it's, a, it's based on a multiplier analysis, basically, looking at um, the, the chances of livelihoods being developed from mining uh, based on a comparison with other alternative livelihoods which may be available and how they might be compromised uh, or not compromised based on mining. So there's a lot of research which went into de developing whether you are in tier one, two, or three. Okay? Um, Armenia did not come into this analysis, and I would uh, like to actually have a follow-up with some of the people at the forum and say, well, maybe you should now go to the next range of countries. This was the top 30 countries which have mining contributing to a you know, large uh, percentage of their, um, their GDP, and where you could have uh, an analysis of this, the next tier of countries in which I, I'm confident Armenia would uh, play uh, a role as well. So what this is showing us is that you, you have, but one of the reasons why this is intriguing is you have countries with very large mineral potential, which are in all three tiers because of the, the relative impact that can happen in terms of their development path. So it's the, the reason why this chart is very important to consider at the starting point of this conference, I think, is that you could be really in all of these different areas. It, there is no real correlation going on here, really, right? Because you could be almost anywhere based on the choices you make as a country. And that's where politics and policy is so essential, all right? So Papua New Guinea, which was mentioned, the Octedi mine, uh, uh, has, is a tier two country with a lot of potential, relatively not as large a mineral prospect as some of the others. Um, but um, has not been realized clearly. The Human Development Index is very low. Uh, and so this is what Armenia has to consider, that you have a, a, a really wide range of possibilities in terms of your future, depending on the decisions that you make. So the, the, the next question which was posed to me is, what were the key factors in making mining uh, a positive contributor to both economic growth and social development? Important to keep those distinctions in mind, and I'm so glad that the, the opening uh, uh, speech by the president actually made that differentiation very clear in, in that range of different comparisons which were presented from the narrative from uh, the Michigan State University president, because there, this is often lost within development circles, even though time and again it is mentioned but when it comes to actual aggregate policy, the economic growth part often drowns the rest because there's a presumption that this is connected to that, right? And what the, the research is showing is that it is definitely not, it is, it's perhaps a necessary but not a sufficient condition. So economic growth is often an, a, an essential part of the development trajectory of a poor country Right? We don't have really any example where in development where you could have a, a rapid change in poverty levels without economic growth, but it is not a sufficient condition. So it is necessary, but not sufficient, which is an important distinction to make in the social sciences. But in policy circles often gets missed. You could have tremendous economic growth, but not necessarily have social development not no, definitively have social development, okay? So what, what is the connection there? And the, the connection, I would argue, is innovation. Innovation is what will lead you to use that economic growth effectively 
to lift your population out of poverty and to sustain a quality of life that is meaningful for that population, right? So that innovation doesn't, when we use the term innovation, often people think you're developing some uh, fancy technology. It doesn't have to be technological innovation. It could be social innovation, right? It could be innovations around traditional knowledge and how you use those traditional knowledge systems. It could be around livelihoods and how you are developing agrarian systems of resilience within societies. So that innovation can have a range of possible manifestations. And that's what you have to see, how that influx of wealth is going to be used for innovation that's going to um, lead you to uh, development, all right? Now, Armenia has many good things going for it, which we cannot ignore, right? The high literacy rate of 98% is, is uh, remarkable and, and uh, something which you should all be very proud of. It does give you a competitive edge. So you are starting from a baseline when, when you think about your potential for using education as a development mechanism, which is pretty good, right? Already, for whatever reasons that may be, that you've had a, you know, a history of uh, education and culture and policies that have led to that. And we have enough research to show that if you have that kind of an education base, the, the rapid use of that education base with appropriate policies for industrial investment can be very positive, okay? So one of the areas of research, this was done by one of my former professors at MIT, Alice Amsden, who passed away last year, sadly. Um, and uh, she did some of her most definitive work uh, on uh, the uh, Asian tigers, the economies there that developed rapidly. You know, it, it's, it's amazing to imagine that uh, South Korea in the 1940s had about the same kind of development uh, indicators as Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, in terms of you know, human development indicators. But except for education and skill sets were different, okay? And it was partly that which allowed South Korea to go on such a rapid development path within a matter of a few decades. Uh, you also have examples, similarly, like with Taiwan, as similar reasons are given uh, as well for the, 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 the potential for very rapid growth. Without Now, that cash injection could be from different sources. It could be uh, foreign direct investment. In the case of South Korea, um, it was initially uh, some uh, investment in the electronics sector, and same with Taiwan as well. It could be with textiles in other parts of the world. Um, it could be also in the case of some Asian economies because of minerals. Malaysia is a case clearly where minerals did play a very important role um, with the initial, initial injection of cash which did lead to uh, further development of uh, other sectors of the economy and diversification. <laughs> but what is very important to remember is, again, because it's that same distinction between necessary and sufficient, that even if you do get that kind of skill set and you get that injection of cash, it may still not be a happy ending if you do not have the same level of distribution of wealth. And this has been happening now in Thailand, which we have seen, right? That even though Thailand itself has developed phenomenally in terms of economic growth indicators, in terms of um, investment from overseas companies, um, a range of issues, but you have a lot of social unrest because the level of inequality is so high. And anyone who has been to Bangkok and takes a taxi cab can see why, right? It's so cheap to take a taxi cab in Thailand. It's ridiculously cheap. But that's a reflection of the fact that the reason why a lot of expatriates li like living there is because they have domestic servants, they have a good life because of the inequality being so high, right? The same would be true of the Gulf countries if you actually calculated the, the number of expatriates who live in countries like the United Arab Emirates and Qatar and so on. But because they, they are often not calculated in the full statistics, um, you get a very inflated view of what the actual people who live there, their quality of life is. So the, the, the inequality, now when it's expatriates who are 
you know, domestic workers who are migrants, it's not as consequential because they're ultimately not vested in the country. But it is very consequential if you have citizens of the country who are not benefiting and who are not seeing the potential for actually having their lives change over time. So that is what's been happening in Thailand. And you have to be very careful about that because the aggregate indicators may not lead you to consider that. Inequality indicators which are used like Gini coefficients, right, which economists use, and we'll have presentations about that, um, are often downplayed when it comes to larger policy discussions. So because there is unfortunately a perception still that if you use the word inequality, you are somehow suggesting um, hearkening back to the old model um, of uh, what was called the second world, or which you, in, in of course, have great uh, familiarity with in terms of the central planning model or uh, the socialist uh, com or even more perhaps extreme, the communist model. But that is not what it means at all. I mean, inequality is something which is uh, structural inequality, is something which, uh, you know, the most mainstream economists will argue is to a, to a, c a certain degree something which we have to uh, study and address. And um, the International Monetary Fund, they, ev all the major institutions recognize that. So inequality, even though in the United States, sadly, it's become a bad word to use. It's a very real mainstream economic development issue, which we cannot ignore. And, uh, and, and it's something which should not be stigmatized by any means. Now, what are the models of successes and failures that Armenia could learn from? So I'll, I won't uh, belabor too much of this. I'll, I'll try to cover a few key factors since some of this has been already mentioned. Um, you have to first of all consider your, your whole panoply of development trajectories. Now, Armenia has some limitations. You know, you cannot ignore the fact that you're a landlocked country. Two of your neighbors you, you do not get along with, unfortunately, not by, you know, I'm not blaming anyone, but the reality is what it is in terms of um, diplomatic relations. So that limits what you can do. I hope that, in fact, economic development can be actually a means for improving those relations, because it can, in some cases, do that. Let us not forget that uh, China and Japan had tremendous grievances with each other and continue to from time to time, right, even now. But when it came to cooperation on economic development, they have shown remarkable pragmatism. The Japanese are among the very few countries. There are basically two or three countries who do not even need a visa to go into uh, China for a month because of business reasons, because there's so much Chinese, uh, uh, there's so much Japanese investment in China. Uh, and this is, remember, this is the same kind of grievance in terms of colonialism and, uh, you know, concerns about huge mass killings and so on, the same kind of things which you have grievances about. Um, so, you know, just keep, take that for what it's worth uh, as, you know, hopefully some way of using economic development as a cooperative tool. You also have a slow population growth rate. Uh, so, you know, you have to consider the fact that you you don't have a major labor pool in the long run, in the, in the foreseeable trajectory, uh, and you don't have a very large population base to begin with. So you're not China with a billion people. You have about three million people, and you are, you are not growing very fast, uh, and you still have a high youth unemployment rate. So you have these limitations, so you have to think about what can you do with those limitations as you choose your development path, right? Because some countries may have many choices, some may not have as many. In your case, you may not have as many choices, okay? Um, and so for mining, being one of those choices when you have a relatively limited one, you need to take it very seriously and you have to consider its potential in that way, okay? One example I give is uh, uh, with uh, where, you, can, where, a, a, where a territory has many choices, like uh, relatively speaking, might be uh, New Caledonia, which is, uh, you know, a French um, overseas territory, and there's a strong independence movement as well there, uh, and I've done a little bit of research there. But in New Caledonia, it has about one-fourth of the world's nickel, right? Um, so clearly, it has, it's been mined for many years, the nickel mining there. But when you think about alternative paths for development in New Caledonia, tourism could have been a very major development path for New Caledonia, because it's, 
in terms of its location. It's very close to Australia and the Asian markets and so on. But there was a deliberate uh, attempt to not develop too much tourism in New Caledonia because mining was already providing um, an important income source. Even though within New Caledonia, it could have been a, a completely a tourist economy like Hawaii. But because it's a, a French overseas territory, there's another French overseas territory which does not have the same options, and that's French Polynesia. So the investment at a planning level for tourism was much more in French Polynesia because they didn't have any other, they had no minerals. They basically, tourism was the main, and fishing to some degree, and Tahitian pearls, but Tahitian pearls are linked to the tourist economy to a large degree. Um, that was about all that was going on there. So it was a deliberate decision to not play up too much tourism in New Caledonia, but to do so in Tahiti and uh, French Polynesia. Now, uh, the other aspect to consider is homogeneity of the population, because mining leading to social unrest, oftentimes one of the reasons why you get it is if there is not a sense of core national identity and you get fractures. So you know this whole notion of the resource curse where you have conflict, happening civil conflict within countries and societies because of um, perception of wealth in some parts of the country and not in others when there is not a strong national bond. Um, we've seen that happen in Nigeria where oil wealth was used to develop, was ostensibly used to develop the whole country rather than developing the Niger Delta where it was being extracted. And Nigeria never had a very strong sense of national identity. So it led to enormous civil strife, which continues to this day, right? Now, the good thing for Armenia is on this account is that you have a relatively homogeneous population, ethnically. <clears throat> so it, that's what's similar to Botswana. Botswana, one of the reasons why it has been so successful is that it's a very homogeneous country. 98% of the population come from one tribe, the Setswana. Uh, you have a very small Kalahari, uh, San community, indigenous community which has had some dissent with the government, um, but because the government had that level of wealth and good leadership is very important in the case of Botswana as well, they were able to have institutions that dealt with those grievances. So in the case of that very small minority which had grievances, there was already a good judicial system in Botswana where there was a litigation against the government for some of the land infringements and policies uh, against this very small minority. And the, the, the Supreme Court uh, actually made a decision against the government, which is very rare to find in a uh, country uh, in that kind of context. Uh, but because the institutions were strong and you had good leadership and they were able to endure. So that's another positive thing for Armenia is you have homogeneity of the population, the chances for civil unrest and differentiation will be relatively small. Now, there, there are ways in which some countries have been able to use their mining wealth very well through mechanisms such as sovereign wealth funds. <clears throat> now, sovereign wealth funds are, um, somewhat controversial still in the literature. And for example, uh, the Oxford economist Paul Collier, whom some of you may know from his many books, The Bottom Billion and so on, uh, he has also started a new initiative called the Natural Resources Charter. And I'm also on the advisory board of the Natural Resources Charter, which is an effort to get countries who have natural resource wealth and companies and other stakeholders to sign on to a very detailed set of principles around uh, natural resources management. Collier has critiqued sovereign wealth funds for countries that need immediate development aid. So if you're a sub-Saharan African country with abject poverty and you have m minerals found suddenly, um, it doesn't make as much sense to have a sovereign wealth fund because you, you have such a huge demand for development to build infrastructure, to build institutions, that if you invest it in a big fund, you, you will get a lot of dissent and you need actually to save lives there and then. So you have to decide how much you want to set aside for the future versus what do you need now. In the case of Armenia, because a lot of your institutions, uh, infrastructure institutions are better than you know the uh, sort of least developed country level, it would make sense to have a sovereign wealth fund uh, because 
you could have some investment up front, but you want to have some money set aside for the rainy day. So you know, countries like Norway have huge sovereign wealth funds, or the Gulf states, the, the UAE, huge sovereign wealth funds, because small population, there's no way they can absorb all that wealth. So they would definitely need to have a sovereign wealth fund to be able to manage it. So when the oil stops in Norway, they will have several hundred billion, it may be a few trillion dollars by the time it stops to do what they want with eventually, right? And that could be used to have a, you know, a certain level of income for every Norwegian citizen, or, or, which is also a way that's used for very wealthy economies with a small population base, where you could actually have all the citizens getting certain cash payments. Um, not always good in terms of incentives for creativity and innovation, but it leads to complacence. Uh, or it could be used to develop different kinds of industrial clusters and so on, okay? So that's something to consider. Um, and um, so it should be actually in Armenia more than one third of the population. It's uh, sorry, it says 1.3, it should have been a slash, there is a typo. Uh, so according to the statistics I came across, about one third of the population is below UN poverty levels, which, which is, you know, concerning, but it's by no means as dramatic as it, it could be in other parts of the world. Now, in terms of multiplier effects, which you'll hear more about, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, also for you to consider then is um, <clears throat> the, the existing labor force. This is not the economic number. The, the economic number for agriculture is less, actually. Uh, uh, this is the, the number of people employed in that sector, okay? Um, for a country of this kind of demographic with about 17% land area, which is currently classified as arable, that should be <clears throat> part of your, your planning horizon. So where is the mining occurring? Will it actually impact the agriculture or not? If it's occurring in <clears throat> areas which are non-arable land, it may not be as concerning compared to those areas which are arable. The water supply clearly will play into that too because the water may be carried down to those areas which are arable and you need to have contingency measures for that. You also need to think about the direct wage differentials for employment. So you may get um, a rise in employment from mining, but you have to think about how many are expatriates versus how many are locals. And that may change over time. Initially, you may get more expatriates and you develop capacity here to have more locals. In the case of Armenia, probably that'll be much faster than in other places. <clears throat> so uh, in, in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, this is a big problem because you have a lot of investment from India and China and the Chinese are bringing in most of their workers because there's just not the capacity in many cases to have indigenous employment. Um, and that, in the case of Armenia, will be less problematic because you already have that skill set. So that's a very positive thing. So it's unlikely that it'll be as big a problem here. Um, but the social mobility of the workforce is also very important. How much will people feel that they can actually rise to the top? Is there a glass ceiling or not? This is a concern in Australia, for example. In Australia, the mining industry says they are the largest single employer of Aboriginal people, indigenous people of Australia which is important because the Aboriginal population in Australia has dramatically lower development indicators compared to the white population, which is an, an embarrassment for Australia that they recognize and they're trying to address. So the mining industry says, look, we are the, the largest employers of um, in, uh, Aboriginal people, but you have to, the devil is in the detail, so to speak. You have to actually see the numbers in more detail to figure out what are they doing? Is it that most of those people are basically going to be truck drivers for the rest of their lives? Maybe they're happy being truck drivers for the rest of their lives. If that's okay, that's fine. If not, if they want social mobility, are there ways for them to have social mobility so that they could actually become executives in the company or not? So that's something which will have to be considered for the rural population. In your case, it's more the rural-urban divide. Will, will there be a concern that all these people from Yerevan are going to come and run the show? Uh, and what about the rural population? Will they actually have the ability to have social mobility or will they be confined to those low wage jobs? Okay. And <clears throat> I think in the case of what I've seen so far based on my reading, you know, there, there is a, some positive efforts made in Armenia by some of these partnerships um, 
um, in, in terms of the Russian and German companies are trying to at least have vertical integration. So like the aluminum sector, aluminum sector, where you have um, foil production in Armenia, which has been done, also the diamond processing sector here, um, looking beyond just mining, but mineral processing, but could be developed further. Uh, and certainly the, uh, the uh, German corporate investment here is also sizable and um, there, there seems to be an interest in vertical integration, which usually means a more lasting sustainable multiplier effect. So that's positive and it's something which you should further uh, consider. Now, uh, corporate performance, I'm now going to try and wrap up soon so we can have a discussion. <clears throat> but I wanted to go into the corporate performance issue because I know in such forums, there is a lot of um, confusion around mining as a corporate sector. Uh, mining is a very complicated corporate sector uh, and a, a, a somewhat secretive one. So it's, it's hard for many people to understand. And our center in Australia has really spent a lot of time trying to understand and build relationships with industry to be able to um, sort of deconstruct and criticize, but constructively criticize so that there can be a positive engagement in the future. So there's a huge range of models. You can have private multinationals, you can have state-owned state companies. There's no panacea. You know, if someone tells you oh, state-owned companies are a recipe for disaster, not true always. Many times state-owned companies are very functional, even in developing countries. The most successful state-owned companies, you know, people talk about airlines, that airlines are always a disaster if they're state-owned. The most successful airline in Africa is a state-owned airline, the Ethiopian Airlines, right? It's a state-owned enterprise, but it's very successful because it has good management and it's had a good ma structure of uh, uh, accountability. So there isn't, you cannot just come up with this. A lot of it depends on how that relationship is put forward, okay? Um, so in the case of uh, Botswana, you have a hybrid company, Debswana, the, the diamond company. It's a partnership with, between a private company, De Beers, and the state-owned Botswana diamond trading uh, uh, diamond company as well. So you could have hybrid models. You have a company like MMG. MMG is a Hong Kong incorporated company, <clears throat> which is majority owned by the Chinese state-owned Mini Metals Corporation. Incorporated in Hong Kong for financial reasons and in Melbourne, where they have their major headquarters for most of their Asia Pacific operations. They've bought several of the older Australian mines and have revitalized them. So it's essentially a Chinese company, very well managed, and it's, in, it's a member of the International Council on Metals and Mining, um, working in some very difficult areas, like in Laos, for example, <laughs> but doing reasonably well. So you can't come up with a statement, blanket statement, oh, Chinese companies are therefore problematic. Not necessarily. Depends how they're operating, how they're managed. Rio Tinto, more classic multinational, well-known, one of the larger mining companies, uh, headquartered in London, but a very devolved management structure. Most of it is actually managed from the regional centers. And very commodity-driven, different uh, management uh, areas. So Rio Tinto Coal is very uh, independently managed in many ways than uh, Rio Tinto Alcan, which was they bought uh, the aluminum uh, company, the uh, Canadian aluminum company. Uh, so that can be a model. Extrata, essentially a holding company headquartered in Zurich for several mining projects all over the world, bought lots of old mining companies and consolidated. Um, so you have a range of models which may work. Then you have this whole panoply of junior companies, which you do have some operating in Armenia. Um, these are companies which frequent events like the Prospectors and Development Association of Canada meeting, the largest mining event that happens. And Armenia, for the first time, attended PDAC in 2010. Your mining minister attended. <clears throat> so that's a sign that there's an interest in getting foreign investment to come in. Highly variable. Not all junior companies are bad. Not all junior companies are good. The problem is junior companies are... The, what is important to remember is that often they do not get as much scrutiny until they have developed the project. So yes, you need to be a little bit cautious with junior companies, um, but at the same time, they may do very well. Depends on how, and sometimes when they're smaller, you can actually go in and monitor and observe them more uh, easily. 
You should also keep an eye on some of these industry initiatives like ICMM, which is the International Council on Metals and Mining, because they, they have very stringent rules and regulations by which they allow companies to join them based on environmental and social responsibility. I know that for a fact because one of my colleagues at the center in Australia, um, Dr. Diana Kemp, she actually is on the panel which um, evaluates companies to be allowed to enter ICMM. And there are many companies which they refuse to accept because they see them as not being good enough. Okay, so that's why being you know MNG being part of it is it's a big deal. So those are ways in which you, as uh, informed public, can also keep a lookout for companies and who is operating there. So you you can actually do your due diligence on corporate accountability. There's this notion which companies use a lot saying that you have social license to operate, okay? Make sure, be cautious when companies use that term. I've been in situations where some company executives have been oblivious of what social license means and you know, they will think this is not a physical license really. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very dynamic and adaptive system. It's not like going to a government ministry and getting a permit. And that, that the, the notion of social license as beyond getting a permit or something which can be taken away much more easily also is important to manage. So it needs constant monitoring. And there's been criticism of this whole um, notion of social license as just simply being around agreements. Just having an agreement is not going to be enough often to um, ensure that you have a social license. It has to be this continuous monitoring, adaptive mechanism to move forward. The pace of mining is going to be essential for you to consider as well. Um, often the pace of mining is driven by price. I would urge all your policymakers to not be taken in just by the, the, the company's pressure on price driving everything on that account because the price is going to be also in partly determined by you know what is the level of cost that you are going to um, put forward in terms of environmental mitigation technologies and all which you have a right to do as a community that may mean that the company may have to wait for commodity prices to rise further before they actually start mining because they have to be profitable too right but that's okay. The good news with mining is the resource is not going anywhere. It's not like an agricultural crop where if you don't grow it for one year, you lose a year's harvest, right? So if you have to wait, it's, it's not the end of the world because you're actually going to still have that as an asset, which could potentially even have higher value when you have resource scarcity in the future. So you have to make those decisions based on the, the, the pace of the mining, based on how much the social cost is going to be to you, okay? And so don't get pressured into the speed of mining now and now or never, because that's, that's simply geologically not true, because the, the resource is going to be there, and it's going to be extractable uh, in the future as well. And there are times in developed countries where a mining negotiation can take a decade one example, the Voices Bay project I often give in Canada, which is now owned by the Brazilian company Vale, another very interesting case story of uh, mining corporate development in Brazil. But uh, Vale bought the, the largest Canadian nickel company, Inco, uh, and the, uh, Inco had a property uh, in Labrador in northeastern Canada, extreme northeastern part of Canada. It took 10 years to negotiate the agreement between the community and the company. But because they took their time and they did it well, when they did a referendum at the end of the day, this was a very sensitive area because they were the Inuit communities, the Inu communities, two indigenous populations who had slightly different views on mining. They got about 80% yes referendum to go ahead with the mining, but it took time. It meant dealing with legacy issues, which you have a lot of. If there isn't trust because there's been a history of bad mining, you have to take time to build that trust. And then when you get it, the community was willing to say yes, 80% of the people, okay? And then finally, independent scientific scrutiny is essential. And this is the role of a university is very important in that because universities have a certain ability to be an epistemic community where you can provide knowledge and inform decision making. 
this should always remain there constantly, going back and forth as an independent measure of scrutiny. And this is true for the environmentalists too, those who may op object to mining at times. They have to ultimately let science provide them the answers. And there isn't one particular scientific judgment. You have to go through, there are some scientists who will agree, some will disagree, but you have a peer review process, you have a deliberative mechanism in the scientific community to come to consensus and say, yes, we agree that this kind of mining process is okay in terms of sustainability and this kind is not. So go through that process and make sure that you come to uh, a meaningful decision then. Now, the, to the companies, this slide is to the company members in the audience. Companies have to be, be more forthcoming. You know, we, we do have a problem with companies many times, especially now the, the, the smaller companies who feel very insecure many times providing data. This is an example of a study which was done by a consulting firm just a few months ago called Mazars is the consulting firm. And they did a study of 500 listed mining companies by email and they also did physical interviews at one of the largest mining events for developing countries, uh, the Indaba conference in South Africa in February. They got only 62 responses. Okay, so that's, you know, little more than 10% response rate. Um, and uh, th that, that shows, and what were they trying to do? They were trying to do a basic study of human rights perceptions in the mining industry, okay? Um, but there was just a reluctance, even when they were going and asking people at the conference, can you give me five minutes of your time and I want to do some surveys? They were reluctant to. So that kind of attitude on the part of the companies, I would say, and I, you know, I'm, I, I have a very sort of constructive engagement with companies. I don't see them as, as uh, I, th I see them as potentially sources of positive um, development. But when you have that kind of attitude where you're not willing to engage, when you're not willing to answer some basic questions even, then you can't blame the community for misperceiving you, right? So, you know, these stock exchanges where they're listed, unfortunately, they have no scrutiny on this. The stock exchanges have, they do not do any oversight, really, in terms of who they're going to list. Um, so some people were asking me, well, can we go to the Toronto Stock Exchange and see if they can, you know, do a, a check on the company? Not going to happen. You have to do it, but then the company has to be proactive also if you're going to, you know, not have too much conflict. So finally, this is the, the diagram which kind of synthesizes, this is from the same World Economic Forum report that we worked on. Some of this sort of what we're calling the six building blocks of responsible mineral development, okay? And um, th this is the, the cycle. You know, if you start from number one, progressive capacity building and knowledge sharing, well, that's happened to some degree in Armenia already. You have a shared understanding of the costs and benefits, not quite there yet, but that's one of the reasons why we're having such events, right? And then you have this process of collaborative stakeholder engagement, which can be through multiple channels. It can be facilitated by the government through a professional mediator. And there are examples of each of these here I'm providing you as well. So if you want to uh, think about, for example, the World Bank has a, an extractive industry source book which our uh, center has been involved in helping them with. Um, we have tailored training development programs like in Africa, AusAid, the Australian Development Agency started this African mining vision. Uh, Australia also sent, uh, started the Mining for Development Initiative, which is one of the universities where it is based is at the University of Queensland. Um, the International Finance Corporation, which is supporting one of the particular projects uh, here in Armenia as well, which is the private sector arm of the bank. They have a series of training for municipal development programs, especially the one in Peru is worth noting. The Royal Bafokang Nation is an indigenous community in South Africa, which had a very unusual system even during apartheid where they controlled their mineral resources. Um, and they have one of the world's largest platinum mines. Um, and they have a community leaders training program. So African professionals can actually become CEOs of mining companies. And we are seeing that now finally in Africa where you, you are getting senior executive of Anglo Gold Ashanti and other companies who are indigenous Africans and not, you know, transplants from London. Um, you've got uh, BHP Billiton, which is an Australian company, and Codelco, which is the Chilean national uh, company, uh, copper company, and they're developing a local suppliers uh, program. <clears throat> so you get 
food and other sources needed by companies to be developed through that. Now for this one, you've got um, ICMM, the International Council on Metals and Mining, I mentioned their whole partnerships toolkit is worth noting. The CEO of ICMM used to be a Greenpeace uh, activist and very much an environmentalist at heart, Canadian guy, Tony Hodge. So he's, he's very committed and sincere that this, is, you know, this initiative should be perceived as objective. Um, so even though it is industry funded, it is, it is a very respectable organization and I would urge you to you know, engage with them and uh, see how they're performing. They're, they have a toolkit which they've applied in Lao, in the, one of the projects, the MMG projects I mentioned, SEPON. Um, Newmont is an American gold mining company and they've had a very interesting engagement with um, small scale gold miners in Ghana, which is not a problem as much here in Armenia, but in other parts of the developing world is very much so. Conflicts between large scale mining and small scale mining. And then you've got this issue around transport processes and engagement. Um, uh, this is going to be, uh, oh, sorry, transparent processes and engagement. And this is where like the EITI, the initiative I was mentioning, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, may provide you some hope. I've heard that people in Armenia are somewhat cynical about it, perhaps because your friendly neighbor is what the first one to have signed on to EITI, uh, Azerbaijan was confirmed. Uh, but for whatever reasons, EITI is still worth considering and it's worth improving. You know, if countries like Armenia or the civil society in Armenia provide feedback to EITI, say this is how you can strengthen it, make it more useful, and then maybe Armenia should join it as well in a more uh, um, robust way, good. You know, those are all important initiatives. I do know that EITI, the board, um, are very much led by civil society groups, Revenue Watch Institute, uh, Transparency International, which, you know, is the most uh, well-respected anti-corruption group in the world, Peter Eigen, he was the founding chair of the EITI. Um, so clearly, EITI is not just an industry shop or a government shop. It is meant to be very objective, but it is a big bureaucracy, uh, and so it does need help. Um, Norway is hosting the secretariat, and Norway itself is a very committed country when it comes to extractive industries and development. Uh, and I know it has an interest in Armenia as well uh, as a European partner. Uh, so keep that all in mind and try to move it forward constructively. Develop, uh, so then the number five is through compliance, uh, monitoring and enforcement of commitments. So this is where your legal system is so important, right? And so I know Armenia has had a revision of its legal system re recently around mining. Um, you may want to push that further and actually see how the enforcement is done. Um, You've got the World Bank Institute trying to develop capacity in ministries to provide training for enforcement so that you actually have people who do audits and can continue with those systems. And then finally, you have um, early comprehensive dispute management systems before the project starts so that all, with such a big investment, something can go wrong. You know, no matter how well you try, there'll be a dispute. And you need to have a system by which you can actually address that dispute and grievance. And this is where you've got a lot of new efforts as well, like the Harvard Kennedy School CSR Grievance Mechanism Guide, which also we collaborated with them on. Our center in Australia worked with them on that. Uh, you have um, Anglo-American uh, establishing a tracking system for grievances, because of, especially in South America, they have had enormous problems around disputes. Um, and then you've got government level efforts. You can get government counselors, so that if there is a community grievance, there's an ombudsperson, or there's some kind of mechanism for dealing with it. Those are sort of the key rubrics for having sort of a good mining development path for a country, which based on this effort, which we did <clears throat> through um, you know, various sources, the World Economic Forum largely handled it, and as I said, I was one of the reviewers, but um, uh, there were you know, a big team of people involved in this effort. And finally, I'll just end <clears throat> with a quotation from perhaps one of the most distinguished uh, Armenian uh, Americans, ethnic Armenian, uh, though born in Iran, like uh, as well, uh, Alain Amerkhanian. Uh, as the, 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 the quotation I'm using for a, f a few different reasons. He gave this commencement address at Stanford in 2006, and he starts off with 
I've, I've chosen parts which I think are meaningful to the event, but um, the speech itself is online if you want to read it in full. But he talks about you know, how when you're dealing with, in a world with information technologies, you have images of pleasure and pain. And with mining, it's the same way. You know, someone is going to show you an image of the, the yellow brick road going to the Emerald City, and someone is going to show you an image of utter despair and loss. Uh, there's fear, there's joy, there's love, there's hate. There's, there are, this is the way of the world, modern society, right? Um, so it is cacophonous. There's a lot of noise out there. It's really the role of academia is to be able to filter and provide some uh, salience and um, clarity to, to that noise. So he says, try to listen to your inner ear in order to survive and to thrive. And that inner ear is really something which comes from <clears throat> what he says is you will have to be lifelong students. This is a commencement address. I consider myself not a scholar in any classical sense, but a continuous student, really. I mean, you, re you cannot, I learn at every event I go to, I often learn probably more than I impart. And that has to be the attitude both for environmentalists and the mining industry and the government and academics. Because it is such a rapidly changing world, same is true of the, certainly the development donors who can often be even more dogmatic about things, um, especially some of uh, you know, the ones who have been very much embedded in one sector, as has been the case with many of the mining uh, sector um, area, area officers I've encountered. So you have to really be lifelong students and your reputation must not be for sale. That is essential, as he says, it must not be mortgaged as down payment on your ambition. So I leave it there and I'm happy to take questions. One question, uh, if I from uh, two angles. So first of it, uh, first of them is the experience of uh, developed countries, of uh, the compensation of natural resources eliminated because of the mining industry, uh, forestry like, or pollution uh, or the payments uh, for pollution of the environment, like uh, waste, mining waste, etc. So could you please bring a couple of examples? Is there such an experience and how is it counted? Like market price or something or somehow, somehow else? Um, so in terms of environmental performance, especially you're interested in? Uh, yes, and uh, the examples of the experience of the uh, developed countries, not, not uh, Botswana or not uh, Papua New Guinea, but uh, Norway, United States, Canada, Australia? Yes, so, um, you know, a lot of it is driven by regulations, and certainly in uh, the developed countries, there are very clear regulations around mining and enforcement of uh, environmental performance of uh, mining. Um, but th there is criticism of even those. I mean, in the U.S., for example, there isn't a specific law dealing with um, just with mining contamination issues, per se, or, or the whole mining sector. There's an 1852 Mining Act, okay, which was largely developed for in, encouraging mining development. So people who are going and prospecting would have the ease of developing mining projects. The only mining specific regulation in the US has been on coal, which is the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. So coal mining in the US is very specifically regulated because of the, the level of damage is particularly great with it. Um, but that too, people would argue, is not being effectively managed because you have certain kinds of coal mining in Appalachia, in Pennsylvania, and that re and West Virginia and all, um, which is uh, referred to by the activists as mountaintop removal uh, mining, and uh, is not being effectively regulated even with that law. So there is a lot of room for improvement even within the developed countries around environmental regulations. It's by no means uh, a done deal with them. And uh, so uh, in Australia, there's you know, constantly pushback around um, cumulative impacts around different kinds of mining projects. Right now in Australia, the biggest growth is around uh, coal seam gas, which is a gas that's derived from particular sort of um, high pressure deposits in, um, and, uh, in, in coal seams and um, you needs a fracturing of rock to get to it. So there are regulations proposed specifically to deal with that. So it's a constant process. I mean, 
uh, going on even in the developed world as well. There isn't a role model out there which is all done, <laughs> which you could just transplant here. You know, you have to keep, each country has to specifically adapt its regulations. Sorry, just I would like to clarify the question, okay? Uh, yes. um, for instance, we have uh, Perut forest in northern Armenia, yes. which is a huge uh, economic resource for agriculture, for tourism, and it's going to be eliminated because of mining industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, how developed states account, and, uh, account the economic loss because ah, yes, of the okay, mining, see, and yeah. is there a system of compensation? Mm -hmm. yes. And how is it accounted, like mar with mar market price, yeah. of forest, or? So there, there are different ways of valuation of loss in that way. So the actual economic value of the timber itself is one, but then th I think what is w w happening more so now is that you're valuing the ecosystem itself and the services that it provides. Now, economists have resisted that because they usually just like to put a price to something which has a market. So an ecosystem doesn't have a market. However, the, the price which you put on the ecosystem can be used for cost-benefit analysis. And um, so there is a movement to develop a system. Just earlier this year, the United Nations established the uh, intergovernmental um, uh, IP best it's called the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is a mechanism to provide the scientific and economic guidance to value resources like that. So biodiversity and ecosystem services, which are uh, somewhat intangible, how would you actually value it? And I hope Armenia is a member of that platform. I'm not sure if it is, but that could provide you with the mechanisms by which you could um, try to value the, the the, the full composite of that forest. Thank you, Dr. Salim Ali, for an excellent sure. presentation. My name is Antoine Terjanian. Uh, just if you allow me a small detail about your presentation, Armenia actually did participate in PDAC in Toronto in 2000. Uh, we had invited them, in fact, the director of mining here. Uh, we wanted to sell them an information system for mapping the underground and the mineral exploration to serve as a base for mineral exploration. Okay. Um, in fact, I want to bring this point. Uh, like, we have activists here who are raising the issue of why, with the value of Teirut and what happens. You know, there's, it's alarming. We are worried about what happens to the people, whether they get poisoned by tailings. Uh, what is important is to have valid data, valid information. This is what we tried to sell the Armenians in 2000, and I don't know whether anybody has arrived to a system where it's not only just a database about what the underground is about, but the impact of different mining and how you can measure it uh, very accurately and so that you can have real cost-benefit analysis. Uh, you have mentioned, and uh, the president has mentioned, that the university can play a very important role and in fact, you mentioned scientific scrutiny and knowledge sharing as one of the building blocks for creating mind. I wonder if you can tell us about the possibility of having such an information system that is unbiased so that we know when somebody's saying, oh my God, our children are gonna die, we are poisoning our country, we're not gonna have anything left, to what extent we are right and to what extent we are not right. Thank you. Yes, certainly, thank you. Um, so in terms of um, processes for that, there are some specific um, um, mechanisms which you could follow. So you could have um, a body of experts which the community and uh, the government and industry agree on who are going to reach consensus around scientific issues of impact. And that has been done in many cases in Canada. Other countries have done that around uh, by establishing uh, ad hoc committees for particular kinds of mining uh, development. Um, and then if there's confidence from that committee, then everyone will agree whatever their verdict is. Um, the other option is that um, you could have uh, international NGOs play that role, which is sometimes they are called to do. So you could have, you, you know, if the donors are willing to provide uh, support for, um, WWF or a particular international non-governmental organization, which may, which is not as um, 
you know, perceived as being as biased as a, as a particular, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, more st uh, strident organization, and they can do that too. So we have had that example of, um, uh, especially for environmental issues, the, the bigger ones, the Nature Conservancy, WWF, uh, Conservation International, they can play a role. IUCN can play that role as well, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, and uh, I think th those are the, the kinds of mechanisms probably which are worthwhile. There's also an organization called Center for Science in the Public Interest, which focuses on providing those kinds of services in the US and Canada. I don't know if they would do it internationally, but they've been very helpful for mining communities where there are conflicting studies and they will do an analysis and look at the studies and they provide very objectively the points. They'll give a presentation to the communities and people trust them. So that can happen too. Yeah. But I, I've been saying, you know, maybe the university should have a center of that kind here, maybe to host and have experts who can provide that platform. And, um, you know, that might be a way to go. Certainly our, our center is asked to do that in Australia sometimes. So, yes, please. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Ali. My name is Sarah Anjargolian, and my question relates to um, the points you made on transparency and accountabil accountability. One of the biggest problems we have in Armenia is that we don't actually know who owns the mines. And although certainly companies are registered and uh, you know, in countries such as Liechtenstein, and there are named uh, folks there, but we don't truly know where the funding is coming from and where the ownership is. I'm wondering if you can comment on that generally. And second, if you can provide some examples of other countries uh, which have had this problem and how they may have dealt with the issue. Thank you. Yes, no, the, uh, you know, I, I kind of alluded to the problem with the, the, the industry in terms of it being so um, ambiguous in, in structure. Um, <clears throat> so the only way really is to have very careful scrutiny of, um, you know, almost like an investigative effort of that company. I mean, the, the, it's the role of journalists really to be able to sometimes find and decipher the, the whole, the workings of a company which is not very um, public in terms of its communication. So um, the stock exchanges is where I'm trying, you know, in terms of policy reform, we should be putting more pressure on, especially the Toronto Stock Exchange, which lists a very large number of these companies who do exploration. Um, if they're going to raise capital through a stock exchange, I think it's the responsibility of that stock exchange to make sure that they do due diligence. But th currently, there's not much accountability for those stock exchanges. And before, it used to be the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Now it's the Toronto Stock Exchange, which is the, the major one for, us, for these uh, mining companies. And I wouldn't be surprised if several of the Armenian ones are listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So that would be one way in terms of future reform, but currently, unfortunately, the only way is investigative reporting. I mean, I, I remember doing research on one particular company which was operating in, um, I was doing some research in Central Africa, uh, and uh, you know, I had to basically be sending emails to some investigative reporter out there uh, in the middle of nowhere in Central Africa who was the only one who was really following what was going on. And he would physically go to the mine sites and see these mining executives come and try to corner them into questions and all. So it's, it's tricky. I think your point is very well taken, that that is a concern with some of the smaller ones. For the larger companies and the ones where, you know, for example, the World Bank is involved, uh, it's not a problem because they, they do have to be more accountable. Uh, it's the smaller exploration companies and all where it is a challenge. Um, hello, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Anna. Um, I want to come back, come back to this notion of price. Um, the first question alluded to, to some extent to that. But I want to ask you one question that is about the incommensurables, things that you cannot put price on. Um, where has the international discourse mm -hmm. um, come come to at this point. I know it's not a discussion, not even a concept here in Armenia. 
we, we put a price on everything, even on our own kidneys, we can sell it easily. Uh, a, a reaver in Armenia can cost $150, that's the price we pay for a reaver. But um, there is the concept of incommensurable um, items, I don't know what, what it is called. Where is the research in academia and beyond um, at the moment? Yes, so uh, in terms of values which um, are more normative, which are subjective and based on individuals, <clears throat> I think that's where in a, in a democratic polity, you know, you have to come to some kind of mechanism to decide. There are some, there are some areas where science will never convince people because they just have a certain view around, like uranium is a classic mineral where there are some very specific normative views around uranium mining which people have because of nuclear weapons. No matter how much science you may present to them about the actual impact of the mining, which can be dangerous but can be done right too, there are many ways in which you can responsibly mine uranium, they will not be convinced because they basically think that uranium mining itself is, is unacceptable. So. In those cases, what I say is, look, you know, that's the beauty of being in a democratic system is that as a, a democracy, you set forward processes which allow you to decide whether certain values are so uh, important, intangible, not, not uh, priceable, but you will not engage with them. And then you go through that. And so you have, in cases like in the Philippines, where a community decided that they would have a moratorium on mining and therefore there was, um, there would, there was going to be no mining until they figured out whether their, you know, their values were aligned with it. So that may be a, a, a way to move forward in cases where the values, but you have to have a process by it. And it should be hopefully driven through um, some you know, constructive debate and not just scaremongering so that those are actually values which are thought through and not out of fear.